Manila, The Savage Streets, 1945, is a solitaire war game simulating the campaign by the American 14th Corps to capture the Japanese-occupied city of Manila between February 6th and March 4th, 1945. You, the player, command the attacking American forces, and the game rules handle the defending Japanese forces. Hi and welcome. This video will walk you through the rulebook and help you get Manila, The Savage Streets, 1945, onto your table and playing faster. So grab your game, open up the rule book to follow along, here we go. We start with the map. The map depicts the city of Manila where the combat took place. The scale is approximately one inch, equals slightly more than a thousand yards. The map is divided into 37 numbered locations called areas. Two areas are adjacent to each other if they share a common boundary thus enabling units to move directly from one area to another area. We will cover this in more detail when we get into movement. A quick note, areas 30 and 27 are adjacent. Each area on the map contains an identifier divided into two halves. The top half contains the number of the area for identification purposes. Areas initially under American control, and there are three, have identifiers color-coded in green. The remaining 34 areas are initially under Japanese control and have identifiers color-coded in red. In this highlighted section of the map, we can see all three Japanese-controlled area types in the game. Each area identifier contains the area number, terrain type, such as circle for clear, square for urban, and pentagon for fort. The terrain type corresponds to the Japanese defender counters placed in that area during setup. Also listed inside each identifier is that area's terrain effects modifier. The TEM for clear terrain is plus two, urban is plus three, and fort is plus four. The TEM is used when resolving attacks against Japanese units in that area. In the far upper right hand corner of the map, you'll find the turn track. The turn track is used to note the game's current turn. And at the end of each turn, Advance the turn marker one space to the next sequential turn on the turn track. You'll notice on the turn track, on turn two, reinforcements for you, the American player. You get six units of the 11 Airborne Division that become available and are placed in any combination of Area 30 and or, if American controlled, Areas 27 and or 28. If placed in Areas 27 or 28, normal stacking rules apply. Also, you'll see on turn 6, the 754th A armor unit is placed in Area 1, and the 754th B is placed in Area 2. Also on turn 6, you'll notice there is a permanent withdrawal. Remove the three units of the 44th Tank Battalion from play, whether they are in the play area, on the turn track, or in the out-of-action box. For each of the three units that are out of action box at the moment of removal, reduce the American morale by minus one. In the upper right hand corner of the map is the American morale track. You start the game with a 19 morale, and if at the end of any combat phase your morale is zero, the game ends in an automatic victory for the Japanese. Just to the right of the morale track is the record track. The record track is used to keep track of any supply points not allocated by the American player during the supply phase. These bank supply points may be allocated in future supply phases. It is also used to keep track of the number of areas under American control for purposes of determining operational victory. In the detail, I have the control set at 10x on 0 and the 1x on 3 to signify the three starting areas that the Americans have at the beginning of the game. When you're rolling supply, if you roll less than 12 on the first turn, you get a supply of 12. And I've also shown that on the record track. The 10x supply is on the 1, the 1x supply is on the 2. In the lower right hand corner of the map is the available support units box. The available support unit box holds air, artillery, and engineer markers the American player purchased during the supply phase. Available support units remain in this box until placed into an area during combat. 
Near the middle of the right hand side of the map is the Use Support Units box. The Use Support Units box holds air, artillery, and engineering markers after the player has used them in a combat phase. In the lower right hand corner of the map is the Out of Action box. The Out of Action box holds American units that were selected for loss during the combat phase. These units are eligible to return to play through the expenditure of supply points. In the lower left hand corner of the map is the Attack and Defense Value Track. You use this during combat as you're tallying up your attack value and your defense value. This track is helpful in combat to help you keep track of your attack and defense value. Pretty aptly named. In the middle of the right hand side of the map is a quick reference to the random event results. A more detailed explanation of the effects of the random events are found on the player's aid card. And finally, on the right hand side of the map is a quick reference to the sequence of play. A more detailed explanation of the sequence of play is found on the player aid. Now let's look at the playing pieces. In the upper right hand corner, it's an illustration that shows the typical American counter. In the upper right hand corner of the counter, you'll have a setup area, or you might have a T2 or T6 for reinforcements coming in on turn 2 or turn 6. Beneath that is your parent formation, in this case the 1st Cavalry. Then you have a movement factor of 8, attack factor of 3, and then the historical unit ID. These are typical armor units and they are distinguished from infantry units by their vehicle illustration. After being activated, and upon completion of its action, a unit is flipped to its spent side. Here are examples of the infantry counters for all three American units. The 1st Cavalry Division, the 37th Infantry Division, and the 11th Airborne Division. And you'll notice on the 11th Airborne Division, the T2 in the upper right hand corner signifying this is a reinforcement coming in on turn two. A leader unit or headquarter has no intrinsic attack factor and may not serve as a lead attacking unit in an attack. This is indicated by the asterisk in place of the attack factor. A leader unit may only add to the attack value of units under its command. In this example, the 37th Infantry Division. Let's take a look at the Japanese units. In its unrevealed state, it'll have its terrain type, fort, urban, or clear. Once it's revealed, you'll see a defense factor as a red number, in this example is seven, and its defense strategy, an ambush. On the player handout is a Japanese defense strategy chart, which details how each of these strategies is played out during the game. And finally, the American control marker. These are placed as Japanese units are eliminated to indicate areas now under American control. Let's start by placing our morale marker on 19. I've shown the back side of the counter so you can see what the shake inside looks like. I put the control at 3. I threw the supply on here at 12, although we still have to roll for it, but if we roll less than 12, it'll be 12. And then I put the turn counter on turn one. Next, I put all my artillery support and engineering support counters in the use support units. If you're using the optional rule for air support, you'll also put those in here. I've shown the back of the counter so you can see the effect that each of these types of support units provide you. Artillery support, plus one attacking value. Engineering support, plus two attacking value. There is also an optional rule that deals with rubble. We'll get into that later. And then air support, which is the most powerful of all of them, in my opinion. You roll 1d6 and subtract that from the defensive value of the Japanese units. During the supply phase, you're going to buy these and put them in the available support box. The amount of support units you can add to any attack is limited by the number of units you are attacking with. So if you're attacking with three units, you can have up to three support units. During the random event phase, once you roll for your random event, you're going to place the corresponding counter 
onto the corresponding event. Now I've placed all the counters here so you can see them. At the start of the game, these counters will be off board and the Kimbu and the Shimbu counters are double sided and I've shown both the front and the back. And finally, I place my defense value and attack value counters on the attack and defense value track for use during combat. Now let's look how we set up our Japanese units. I like to use a bowl and put the chits in, pull them out randomly, and face them unrevealed side up in each of the areas corresponding terrain type. We will do this to all 34 areas on the map. Now I actually like to put them next to the identifier in the area, so when I'm looking over the map, I can easily spot areas that I missed putting in counters. Now the game includes extra Japanese units for each terrain type to prevent the player from being able to determine the exact Japanese defense strategy in an area based on already revealed Japanese units. It also allows for more varied gameplay and randomness. Let's take a look at our player's aid. It's a double-sided card on one side contains the Japanese defense strategy chart with the various defense strategies and a detail of their effect. It also contains the American supply cost, listing out all the various support units and their cost and supply. It also has a movement cost table that details the movement point costs to move into various areas. The other side has a listing of your reinforcements, what turn they come in, as well as the forced withdrawals. There's a sequence of play, along with the combat phase, combat resolution, determining attack value and defense value, and then your random event chart detailing the events and their effects. Now we move into our sequence of play, starting with the dawn phase and reinforcements. The player receives reinforcements twice during the game. On turn two, the six units of the 11th Airborne Division that become available are placed in any combination of Area 30 and or, if American controlled, Areas 27 and or 28. If placed in Areas 27 or 28, normal stacking rules apply. On turn six, the 754th A Armor unit is placed in Area 1 and the 754th B is placed in Area 2. Also on turn six, there is one permanent withdrawal. Remove the three units of the 44th Tank Battalion from play, whether they are in the map area, on the turn track, or in the out of action box. For each of these three units that are in the out of action box at the moment of removal, reduce American morale by minus one. If a leader unit was placed in the out of action box during the previous turn, Roll a 1d6 during the dawn phase to determine their fate. Roll 1d6. On a roll of 1 or 2, the leader is KIA and removed from play. On a roll of 3 or 4, the leader is considered lightly wounded and that leader may return to play during the dawn phase of the next turn. To indicate this, move the leader unit from the out of action box to the turn track for the following turn. On a roll of five or six, the leader is uninjured and returns to play immediately. A leader unit that is returned to play is placed fresh side up in any area that is American controlled and contains at least one other unit of the same division or the unit's original setup area. Following the dawn phase is the random events phase. Player makes a 3d6 roll and consults a random event chart on the player aid card. Place that event marker in the corresponding space printed on the map as a reminder. For the American units that get a pause result in the random event chart, I like to flip them over to their spent side. It's just an easy way to remember while I'm playing out the rest of the turn. No results. Treat any pause result on turn 1 and turn 9 as no result. If the same American division is paused for a second consecutive turn, treat that result as a no result as well. You'll have to remember this as this is not noted on the player aid card. Finally, treat the Iwabuchi breakout as no result if there are no American controlled urban or fort areas. 
this condition is listed in the random events phase on the player aid card. And finally, for the Kimbu and Shimbu group breakout, for each of the three units belonging to the 44th Tank Battalion that is in the out of action box and unavailable to be withdrawn, reduce American morale by minus one. The units withdrawn as a result of a random event return as reinforcements the following turn and may be placed in Area 1 or Area 2. The withdrawal of the 44th Tank Battalion as a result of the random event is not to be confused with Turn 6 permanent withdrawal of these same units. After the random events phase is the supply phase. At the beginning of the supply phase, the American player rolls 4d6 for supply points. And remember, treat any result less than a 12 as a 12 on turn 1. Supply points are marked on the record track with the game's two supply markers. Supply points can be expended to purchase support markers, return units in the out of action box to play, and or to increase American morale. Costs are listed on the player's aid card. A unit in the out of action box that returns to play must be placed in an American controlled area containing at least one other American unit of the same division or that division's original setup area. So what that means is if you have no units of that division on the board, then you're going to have to place them in their starting area. Unspent supply points may accumulate from turn to turn. These bank supply points may be used in future supply phases. At the start of the combat phase, the player rolls 1d6 for each contested urban or fort area on the map. Of note, a result of 4 place any one American unit in the out of action box. That American unit must come from the area where the bloody streets is being resolved. In our example, in area 13, we rolled a 5. Because there is an elite Japanese unit in area 13, we add 1 to our dice roll and get the result of 6 plus, which is flip the units to spent and reduce the American morale by 1. That didn't end well for us. The American Action Rounds The combat phase is made up of individual action rounds. During each action round, the American player may activate areas on the map containing fresh units to move and or attack. We'll be doing a deeper dive into the rules for the move and the attack shortly. After becoming activated and upon completion of its action, a unit is flipped to its spent side. An exception is an overrun result in combat. The combat phase ends when all American units are spent or the player declines to activate additional areas. Determine if the player has won an automatic victory. The end phase. If you have not won an automatic victory, flip all spent American units back to their fresh side. Reduce American morale by one. Remove any event markers placed in the random event chart during the random event phase. Advance the turn marker to the next space on the turn track. Any support markers still present in the available support units box remain there and continue to be available. Ending the game. If the player has not won an automatic victory by the end of turn 9, a final victory check is made. The American player wins an automatic victory if at the end of any combat phase, every area on the map is American controlled. If American morale is zero at the end of any combat phase, the game ends with an automatic victory for the Japanese side. If every area on the map is American controlled at the end of a combat phase, and at the same time morale is zero, the American player still wins an automatic victory. Let's talk about stacking. A maximum of six American infantry and or armor units may occupy a single area. There is an exception that in areas 1, 2, and 30, there are no stacking limitations for the American player. Leader units and support markers do not count against stacking limits. Also, a maximum of one Japanese unit may be stacked in an area at any given time. In our example, area 13 has two units when calculating your stacking limit. Area control. Each area is always controlled by either an American player or the Japanese side. An area containing a Japanese unit is always Japanese controlled. 
An area lacking a Japanese unit and containing an American control marker is always American controlled. Control changes when an American unit occupies a vacant area that was previously controlled by Japanese side. An area is considered contested if it contains both American and Japanese units. American units contesting an area that is controlled by the Japanese does not alter the control of that area. An area is vacant if it contains no Japanese units, regardless of the presence of American units. Now this note is a bit contradictory. It says a vacant area is always American controlled, yet earlier in 7.2 it says control changes when an American unit occupies a vacant area that was previously controlled by Japanese side. Since the only way to clear an area of Japanese units, because they're not allowed to move, is to defeat them, then an American unit will be in a Japanese controlled area when it becomes vacant, thus occupying it, thus always making a vacant area under American control. Let's start off talking about water boundaries. American units may not move between area 11 and 37 or 12 and 37. Their boundaries are not adjacent to each other. Now let's get into some combat and movement example. Both are intertwined during a single activation. We're going to start by activating area 6, San Francisco Del Monte Estate. We're going to be moving both the 5-6 infantry units from the 1st Cavalry into Camp Murphy. It costs 2 to move into Quezon City because there is an adjacent Japanese unit, and then 4 to enter an area containing an unrevealed Japanese unit. Because the area was not contested, this triggers a mandatory attack. For the sake of this video, let's assume that attack ended in a stalemate. Just a little note, I like to use the American control markers when I control an area and place it on top of the area identifier with the white side up. During a turn, when I activate an area, I turn the control counter to the green side up so I know which of the areas I'm currently working on that's been activated. With that in mind, we activate Kazon City. We move the 3-8 armor unit and the 5-6 infantry unit, both from the 1st Cavalry, from Kazon City into Camp Murphy. We are entering an area containing a revealed Japanese unit, so it costs us 3 movement factor. Even though we are attacking Camp Murphy, which was attacked earlier in the turn, we are not attacking from the same activation, but a new area activation that allows us to attack Camp Murphy a second time, as long as we don't go over the stacking limits in that area. Because the Japanese defense strategy, Fanatic, was used during the initial reveal of the Japanese counter, it is no longer in effect when we attack now. All we have to deal with is the plus 5 defense value. We decide to add two artillery support units. That allows us, with the infantry and the armor unit, to gain a plus one combined arms bonus. So let's use our attack defense value track and resolve this combat. As mentioned earlier, the Japanese have a defense factor of three and a terrain effects modifier of two, giving them a five. We have an attack factor of five, having chosen the infantry unit as our lead unit. We get a plus one for the additional unit. We get plus two for the two artillery supports. Because we have combined arms, we get a plus one. And then our morale bonus is another plus one, giving us a grand total of plus 10 on our attack value. The Japanese roll a 10 on their attack and go from five to 15 for their defense value. We roll a nine, added to our 10, gives us a 19 for our attack value. The difference being four, we check the result. That's an overrun, baby. We scored an overrun victory because the difference of the combat of plus four is greater than the Japanese unit's defense factor of three. The result of an overrun is the Japanese unit is eliminated and removed from the map. We've placed our American control marker in the area. We advance the American control markers on the record track all attacking units remain fresh and may be activated in a future action round. And if you notice, Camp Murphy now has an American control marker in it, and we haven't activated there. 
So we will be able to activate Camp Murphy and those two units. Also, we have yet to finish Kazan City. So let's finish the activation there. So to finish our activation in Kazan City, we're going to take the two unactivated units and we're going to move them into Area 15. Now, because that's a contested area, it's not a mandatory attack, but we cannot combine with the armor that's already there. So we're going to choose to end our activation and flip those two units to spent. Next, we're going to go into Area 15. We're going to activate the one armor unit. And again, because we can't combine our attacks, we want to wait till next round. And because it is an optional attack, we're going to choose not to, and we're going to go ahead and flip the armor to its spent side. So next turn, these units will all be fresh. We'll have a HQ, an armor, and an infantry. And when we add some artillery support, we will get not only a leader bonus, but also a combined arms bonus. This Japanese unit has a defense factor of 8 plus 3 for a total of 11. We're going to need everything we can to dig them out of there. Let's talk about the different combat results. First is Repulse. If your attack total, after you've rolled your dice, is less than the defense total, the American attack has been repulsed, and there's no effect on the Japanese unit. The leading American unit is removed from the area and placed in the out of action box. All of the remaining attacking units are flipped to their spent side. Retreat is required in cases of failed mandatory attacks. So if it's not a mandatory attack and you get a repulse result, the units are spent and they stay in the area. Next is stalemate. If after rolling the dice, both the attack and the defense values are equal, the American attack has suffered a stalemate. There is no effect on the Japanese units and all the attacking units are flipped in their spent side. A success. If after rolling the dice, the attack total is greater than the defense total, the American attack has achieved a success. The Japanese unit is eliminated and removed from the map. All of the attacking units are flipped to their spent side. Place an American control marker in the area. Advance the American control markers on the record track as needed. And lastly is an overrun. If the attack is a success and the difference between the attack and the defense is greater than the defense factor of the revealed Japanese unit, an overrun has been achieved. That does not include the terrain effects modifier. Advance the American control markers on the record track as needed. All attacking units remain fresh and may be activated again in a future action round. An overrun also cancels the effect of fanatic Japanese defense strategy. Here's a unique result. If the combat result is a success or overrun, but the lead attacking unit is eliminated due to a Japanese ambush defense strategy and was the only American unit, remove both the American unit and the Japanese unit and place the American control marker in the area. Advance the American control markers on the record track as needed. The American Retreat Procedure Attacking units may only retreat into the area from which they entered the attack area. Units must retreat one at a time to determine if the area becomes fully stacked. If it does, subsequent units must continue to retreat to another area that is not fully stacked. Note, American units that retreat as a result of the Japanese barrage or the Iwabachi Order's breakout random event follow this procedure as well. Captured Area Morale Bonus Increase American morale by plus one each time an American control marker is placed in an area with an American flag. These are Intramuros, Provisor Island Power Plant, Fort William McKinley, and Rizal Stadium. So we've covered all the basic rules to get you playing Manila, the Savage Streets, as quickly as possible. Refer back to this video if you have questions about the basic rules, and I will leave the example of play on page 10 for you to play on your own and use what you've learned in this video, as well as on page 8, the optional rules. Once you've played this game two or three times, go back and insert some of these optional rules which will spice up the gameplay and add a bit of variety. Manila, The Savage Streets is a wonderfully fun game and extremely beginner friendly in my opinion. I'm looking forward to more games in this series and if you haven't, look at getting Stalingrad, Advance on the Volga, 
the first game in this series. Thank you for watching, and as always, I appreciate it. If you found this video useful, please like, leave a comment, and subscribe to the channel. I will see you in the next one. Goodbye for now.